good morning let's uh, get started with a new module this is module 7 in our original scheme and these modules 7 followed by 8 they will be relatively short now the new topic that we are going to start today is the drag and lift forces acting on bodies and these are of very great practical importance soon you will see why it is so let us first try to understand what is the meaning of these terms drag and lift ok it is all listed here but whenever you have a real fluid and there is a relative motion between the body and the fluid you are bound to get resistance to motion and that kind of a resistance in the direction of motion is what you call the drag force. In addition you will also see that the body experiences a force normal to the direction of motion and that force is what we call as the lift force. So here the body is not unidirectional so at every bit of its surface force will be acting and those bits can be resolved parallel to the direction of motion sum it up that will give you your drag force. Similarly take the component of the small bits acting on the surface normal to the direction of motion and you sum it up that should lead to the lift force that is the basic understanding and the definition of these forces ok. So here I have listed that both shear force can act as well as pressure forces also can act simultaneously. Now the part of the drag force which arises out of viscous action you call it as viscous drag or an alternative name is skin friction drag both mean the same thing whereas the drag force that results out of difference in pressures acting on the forward and backward that kind of a force is what is known as the pressure drag because that is arising out of pressure differential or it is also called the form drag. Why form drag? It depends on the shape of the body, form of the body that is why you call that form drag. But these are very common pressure drag and then viscous drag, skin friction drag. These names you will get used to very quickly. Now what happens to the total drag force that acts on the body? It is composed of two components one of them is the viscous force drag due to viscous force and the second part is due to the pressure differential which we call the form drag. This is a very general statement however depending on the shape of the body one of these could be predominant compared to the other or there are cases where both are equally important. So let us see what are these going to be ok. The relative importance of the viscous drag and the form drag depends on the shape of the body and also orientation of the body with respect to the direction of motion. Simply any shape is not enough. You have to also say shape in what way is it oriented in the flow. That also will be clear after we take a very simple example. Now before I come to the statements have a look at these. One is a flat plate, the flow is parallel to that. You are very familiar with this kind of a flow 
where we are going to get a boundary layer and we also have derived earlier either based on Blasius solution or based on Kamen's integral momentum equation. How to find the drag force on a flat plate? Now, this plate being parallel here, there is no difference of pressure between the front and the rear of the body, meaning this is a case where the entire drag force is due to viscous action. So, here viscous drag force is the one, there is no pressure drag, pressure drag is 0. Now, same plate instead of holding like this, I will turn this way, okay. Maybe I have shown it smaller, but let us imagine the same plate I can turn at right angles and hold it here. Then what do I observe now? Because of these flow lines bending on top of this space, there could be shear stress acting on the face of the plate, but this shear stresses they cancel out because of the symmetry. It may be there, but really it does not bother you because whatever you have on this half is also there in the reverse direction on the other half. So, both cancel out. So, consequently what will be the viscous drag in this case 0. However, flow real fluid flows cannot turn like ideal fluids and because of that the flow lines streamlines separate from these edges. Because of this flow separation the downstream side will have low pressure and the upstream side will have high pressure. So, if I now take the resultant of these forces acting on this face and on this face you will end up with a large force in the direction of motion. Hence you have only pressure drag and this zone where you experience low pressure is known as the wake. Okay. So, always flow separation causes a wake and that wake is a zone of low pressure. So, that is why here the total drag is due to pressure, here the total drag is due to viscous action. So, the statement that depends on the shape of the body and orientation that is important, okay. So, if you read now these statements, okay, thin plate held parallel to the free stream, viscous forces predominant, pressure drag is 0, place is, plate is uh, held normal to the direction of flow. So, the drag force experienced by the body is due to pressure differential and that is viscous drag is 0, only the pressure drag exists. Now, accepting this kind of a thing, flat plate, it is very difficult to get the drag force acting on a body theoretically. So, mostly you have to depend on experiments. So, experimentally determined coefficients are quoted in your books or references and there could be a minor change in these values. Do not worry about the decimals and so on. Depending on the test each one reports a slightly different value, but look at the magnitudes, the relative sizes. So, I have taken only some of the typical shapes of bodies and listed here the coefficient of drag and what is coefficient of drag? If you remember it is nothing but the non-dimensional form of expressing the drag force experienced by a body and it is defined as drag force divided by half rho u square into area. But that area has to be understood in the proper context. If it is a plate, then the area will be area of the plate. If it is a bluff body or a blunt body where flow separation takes place, in that case the area is taken conventionally as the frontal area. 
So, in a thin plate there is no frontal area that is the reason why we take the area of the plate as a reference in the definition of your coefficient of drag. So, these are the values for the CDs okay body shape two dimensional circular cylinder that means a cylinder which is long in this way circular cylinder. The value of CD is close to 1.2 some quote it as 1.1 1.15 it does not matter it is around 1.1 to 1.2 but there is a range these are all experimental values. So, this is this value can be taken as values if you happen to have a Reynolds number in this range 10 to the power 4 to 1.5 into 10 to the power 5 elliptic cylinder. So, this is elliptic one with a ratio of 4 is to 1. So, 4 in the direction of motion 1 here. So, here you see how dramatically the coefficient of drag comes down okay. and here again you put the range of your test. Then comes a two dimensional square cylinder means cross section is a square and two dimensional means long in this direction and here the quotient of drag is quite high 2.0. Circular disc 1.17 when I say circular disc it is similar to the circular plate that I showed to you. So, the entire drag force is due to your form drag or pressure drag no viscous drag very little thing. Now, open hemisphere, hemisphere you can understand a cup, open means it is not blocked totally, it is like an empty cup. Now, this is the direction of flow, I can hold the cup this way, so the concave part is facing the direction of flow or I can also hold the cup this way, so the convex part is facing the flow. As expected, you will not get the same kind of a drag force hence not the same CD value and what is the reason? Now, if it is like a hemispherical this one this side is facing this value of CD is close to that of a spherical object you will find shortly what is the value of CD for a spherical object because in the front the flow is taking place very smoothly on top and then separates from these edges. If you put this way what happens the flow comes hits it goes round goes round at the corner takes a bigger trajectory meaning the size of the weight is much bigger. Consequently the coefficient of drag force also is much larger that is the reason why if you hold let us say rod like this attach same size cup this way same size cup this way and if there is flow what will happen? The drag force on this cup will be much larger compared to this. So, there will be torque and that is the one which keeps that moving and you can calibrate the RPM of this and that is what you call a anemometer anything that you use to measure the speed of here let us say is called a anemometer and these are very common you know you find the cups are rotating and they are calibrated. So, if you know the RPM you are able to find out what the wind speed is ok. Now, let us talk more about flat plates this you remember we had got it from laminar bound layer theory and that too from Blasius solutions. Then for a 1 7 power law which was proposed by Frankel we also have this expression. I did not tell you the details of the derivation, but it is possible to derive this relationship for a turbulent boundary layer and remember Frankel's 1 7 power law is valid only for a turbulent boundary layer. And what is the range? 
this is the range of Reynolds number. Why this range is necessary? Because it can be shown that in this range only the 1 seventh power law is valid. So they are all linked. If in this range 1 seventh power law is valid and because of 1 seventh power law you will be able to derive this kind of an expression okay from integral momentum equations. Now if the Reynolds numbers are fairly high right up to 10 power of 9 an empirical equation was proposed by Schlichting and that is CD equal to 0 0.455 divided by log of REL to power 2.58. Now do not forget that REL stands here for the plate Reynolds number meaning it is defined as U the free stream velocity into L the length of the plate divided by the kinematic viscosity mu. Now the revised values of the quotient of drag for a flat plate accounting for laminar boundary layer can be written as this. Now what is the meaning of this? Do not worry about the derivation but what is the meaning of this first understand the physical concept. See the earlier expressions whether it is this one or this one both assume that the boundary layer is turbulent right from the leading edge. But in reality what happens is there will be an initial length here critical distance up to which the boundary layer is laminar subsequently there is a transition and the boundary layer becomes turbulent. So there is a small length in the beginning where you need to make this adjustment for existence of a laminar boundary layer. So you have to apply a correction because had it been turbulent right from beginning then you get some value but because it is laminar, laminar boundary layers will always have a lesser value. So that is why you have to deduct a bit here to account for the laminar boundary layer which exists in the beginning of the flat plate okay. But generally if the Reynolds numbers are fairly high you will find that these quantities they happen to be very very small okay. But it is good to keep in mind that one can modify the originals to take into account the existence of a laminar boundary layer at the beginning of the flat plate. Now these relationships what I have given can be plotted graphically and how does that look like? Just it is good to interpret what is the meaning of these lines. Okay. This is a line which corresponds to laminar boundary layer and boundary layer is laminar till a value of 5 into 10 to the power of 5 up to that Reynolds number the boundary layer behaves like a laminar boundary layer. For higher values it behaves like a turbulent boundary layer. So here same equations have been plotted okay even at little lower values but the turbulent flow had it been turbulent this is what you will get had it been laminar this is exactly what you get those equations you plot it on this scale log log scale and because of the change from laminar boundary layer to turbulent boundary layer there is a transition and this is what you are going to get exponentially. So you will realize now that if you are you are Reynolds numbers are small you might unless you make the boundary layer artificially turbulent you will be here but if somehow you trigger it put disturbances into the boundary layer you may become turbulent even at a lower value of the Reynolds number. So depending on whether the boundary layer is turbulent or the boundary layer is laminar you could be here or you could be here but when the transition takes place from laminar to turbulent you will be around this. So from this graph you will be able to predict what is the value of CD okay and it is CD because it is a small quantity 
while plotting, you are plotting really C D into 10 to the power of 3. So, whatever value you read here, C D will be equal to this value divided by 10 to the power of 3, okay. So, the explanation for that is that the lower straight line is meant for laminar boundary layer, the upper ones are for turbulent boundary layers. You find two curves, many books will find even more than this. They are very pretty close. Only thing the equations, the empirical equations are slightly different that you have get a very marginal difference between the two curves. The curve in the middle means this one, okay, that connects the two represent the variation of C D in the transition range. Then finally, what is the observation here? Once you exceed this Reynolds number, okay, 10 power of 6 into 3 or 4, something like that, does not matter. You find that the this one merges with this meaning that the entire drag force is due to turbulent boundary. So, the role of transition is gone. Now, if you remember, we took an example when we were talking about the drag force based on Kalman's uh, integral momentum equation. I remember we did the same uh, problem, but quickly let us go through that to maintain continuity. This is a tanker whose length is given the beam means width is given and draft means the depth of submergence is 25 meters estimate the force and power required to overcome skin friction drag at a cruising speed of 13 knots and how to convert 1 knot is given so many 1852 meters per hour is called 1 knot at 10 degrees Celsius viscosity is given all right this is not u this is uh, nu okay is given. So, whenever you come across this kind of problems, the best way is to start to find what is the Reynolds number, then you will get an idea as to which empirical formula is more suitable. So, here L is given, nu is given, Reynolds number fairly high, very high because the length of the uh, tanker is very, very much. Then because it is 10 to of 9 of that order, you are going to use, you do not worry whether it is 10 to of 9 or 1.7, it will not vary much once you are away from this range by a small margin, it should not matter. So, you make use of this formula for coefficient of drag due to friction and if you put these values then you find this minus as I said earlier the correction is very little okay. So, very often you may not even have to worry about this component small component. So, you are getting CDF value keep ready all these uh, quantities half rho u square half rho is being salt water instead of 1000, you are taking that 1020, okay, kg is per meter cube and u is given to you 6.69 square, so many newtons per meter square is this value. Total area to be considered is the bottom and also two sides. So, that is what we find here, bottom length is 360, width is 70 plus two times the two sides length is 360 and depth of submergence is 25 meters. So, it comes out this quantity. Therefore, go back to your definition of CDF. So, therefore, force will be CDF into half rho u square into area. All these bits we have found and finally, power will always be equal to force into your velocity force into distance is work done and work done per second will give you the power. So, that is why u if you multiply force multiply by u you get so many million watts okay. So, far so good because we were talking 
only about a flat plate and here there is no pressure drag flat plate ok. Now when we talk about bluff bodies, bodies like spherical one typically sphere is a bluff body, cylinder is a bluff body, even elliptical shape depending on the aspect ratio is also a bluff body. So these are the ones cylinder, sphere, elliptic cross section, rectangular cross section, a finite aspect ratio, flat plate held normal to this also can be classified as a bluff body because what is the property of a bluff body that the pressure drag is a dominant force whether it is 100 percent or it is 60, 70 it does not matter it is dominant. So once you have a body where the pressure drag is the main force you classify that as a blank body or a bluff body both mean the same thing that is what is written here for bluff bodies the frictional drag component is very small relative to the pressure drag or the form drag. Now once you appreciate why you get form drag this statement also will be clear. The quotient drag is independent of the Reynolds number above a threshold value. Normally this threshold value is not very big. What it says is in case of blunt bodies, why do you get the pressure drag? Because the flow is unable to stick to the boundary, it separates. Because of flow separation, there is a wake formation. Now the point of separation depends on the Reynolds number under some range, but in some other range, the point of separation is independent of the Reynolds number. So in the range where it is independent of Reynolds number, the size of the wake will not change. Hence, when you talk about the coefficient of drag, you will find that it is nearly constant. Here again, keep in mind, we are saying coefficient of drag is constant, not the drag force. Higher the value of velocity, you will have higher drag. But the moment you put it in non-dimensional form, the drag force divided by half rho u square. So when I take the ratio, that remains nearly constant, not the drag force. Drag force will increase as if it is constant, Cd is constant. What does that show? That your drag force is proportional to square of the velocity. That is why when you take the ratio, it always ends up with a similar value, okay. Now, here drag force curve is flat. In fact, it is good to see, it is good to see, uh, let us say we, I show this first and then we will go there. Have a close look at this one. There are lots of experimental points. What you are plotting on this x axis is the Reynolds number and on the y axis your Cd. Now if you remember you are keeping motion ok. So we had there the value for Cd as the constant divided by Reynolds number ok. Now if you plot it in log log scale, what will be the shape of that curve relationship? Cd is a constant divided by Reynolds number that is Stokes law for tripping motion. So what will that show up here on the curve? Okay. Cd is a constant divided by Reynolds number. So I take log side when I say plot and log log what you are really doing is log of Cd is equal to some constant log of that minus because Reynolds number is in the denominator minus you know log of R. So that means if I plot it it will be a minus 1 slope. So 
here up to a and what was the range of your Stokes motion Reynolds number 0.1 at best you can stretch up to 1. So here this is what is 10 to the minus 1 is 0.1. So it is not shown here because in reality some books will give you even one more cycle here. So that will plot out as a straight line and that agrees very well with observed values. But the moment the Reynolds number increases beyond 1, okay, this is point 1, point 0.2 and this is 10 to the power of 0 is 1. So in this range, it will be straight line and the straight line if I extend, what does it show? The actual curve starts deviating from the straight line and that is expected because your assumptions are breaking down. The assumption there for a creeping motion was your initial forces were very small compared to your viscous forces. So here as you as you go along here you get this and this is what I was saying earlier there is a threshold value approximately let us say 4 into 10 to the power of 2 or even 10 to the power of 3 even if I say a thousand that is all the Reynolds number you want beyond which this is nearly constant okay and that value is around 0.04 to 0.05 about that this is for a sphere. Right. Now so when we go back here drag the drag coefficient curve is flat in the range of 10 to the power of 3 to 3 into 10 to the power of 5 for Reynolds number of around 3 into 10 to the power of 5 something very interesting happens. The laminar boundary layer that grows on top of the surface undergoes a change and the boundary layer becomes turbulent and what is the property of the turbulent flow exchange of mass and momentum. So when you have a boundary layer is growing on the surface suddenly it becomes turbulent means there is more exchange of momentum between layers. Consequently the layers close to the boundary are now energized and will be able to follow the, the curve or the sphere surface little more after that it starts separating. So if this is the picture what hap what will happen to the size of the wake had the boundary layer been laminar the size of the wake is large. Once the boundary becomes turbulent because of this exchange of momentum also energizing the layer adjacent to the surface the point of separation will shift because it shifts the size of the wake becomes small consequently the pressure drag will drop and in case of a blub body pressure drag is the dominant one no doubt because there is an increase in area of contact the skin friction drag may increase a bit but that is a small amount the major thing that is in picture is your pressure drag. So consequently when you take the total there will be a sudden reduction in the drag force and your the value of that uh, CD suddenly drops as you see here goes up to this laminar boundary layer suddenly it drops and it drops to a very small value point even 1. So here the drag coefficient was close to 0.5 suddenly it drops to 0.1 you see what a great reduction now the drag force is only 20 percent of what you were having when the boundary layer was a laminar boundary layer. So let us uh, see this drag coefficient is flat or around this the laminar boundary layer on the front part of the sphere undergoes a change and the boundary layer becomes turbulent. In a laminar boundary layer the fluid particles moving close to the surface are 
able to overcome the resistance due to viscous action in the presence of a favorable pressure gradient in front half of the sphere. Now, if you remember long ago, right in the beginning, we had discussed what is the meaning of a favorable pressure gradient and an adverse pressure gradient. Now, what is the physically you understand? Do not worry about a lot of mathematics that is involved. If a fluid particle is moving here, there is a pressure force, there is a pressure force on the fluid element. Supposing this pressure force is bigger compared to this pressure, means what? Pressure is dropping in the direction of flow. If pressure is dropping, what will happen to dp by dx? Negative quantity, fine. Now, what is the role of this pressure? This fluid as it moves, always there will be frictional resistance, opposing motion, but this pressure that comes into play is trying to overcome that because this side the pressure is larger, this side it is less. Hence, we call this kind of a pressure gradient as a favorable pressure gradient because it is trying to overcome and help the fluid particle to move, favors. That is why it is called a favorable pressure gradient. So, a favorable pressure gradient will always be denoted as dp by dx is less than 0. Now, there could be instance where the fluid particle is moving close to the boundary. Pressure on this side is less compared to the pressure on this face. So, pressure being larger here compared to this, what will happen to dp by dx? Positive. But what is the role of this pressure now? This pressure, this side is small, this side is large. So, difference. So, pressure is also trying to resist motion of this fluid particle and it is rather going along with the resistance in the same direction. So, the fluid particles will be retarded faster in the presence of an positive pressure gradient which we call adverse pressure gradient. It is adverse, it is trying to you know create hurdle for this fluid particle to go in the forward direction. So, here the flow past the cylinder we discussed in great detail. The purpose was to understand first how the pressures are changing over the surface of the cylinder. Now, we realize that at the beginning we have stagnation point, velocity 0, hence pressure is a maximum. As you go along the surface, what happens to the velocity in the ideal fluid case, flow past the cylinder we discussed earlier, the velocity goes on increasing and by the time you are at 90 degrees, the velocity is 2 times u. That means, velocity is going on increasing. So, what will happen to the pressure? The velocity increases from Bernoulli principle, pressure goes on dropping. If pressure goes on dropping, what happens to your nature of the pressure gradient dp by dx is a favorable pressure gradient. So, in this front half, the pressure gradient is a favorable pressure gradient, but beyond this 90 degree, at least in theory, the velocity goes on now decreasing, it should come back to stagnation, another stagnation point 0. So, if velocity goes on decreasing, what happens to the pressure goes on rising. Now, if pressure goes on rising in the direction of flow, dp by dx is positive and that will be adverse pressure gradient. So, as you go along this, there will be adverse pressure gradient. Now, if it is an ideal fluid flow, it did not matter. We could imagine that the fluid particle will start from here, go to a maximum velocity and then come back to 0. But in real fluids, when there is viscous action simultaneously occurring on the surface, this front half poses no problem because pressures are helping the fluid particle to push it forward. 
but around this close to 90 degrees the shaft line take could be 85 86 degrees beyond that now the viscous actions do not get help viscous action is always opposite to the direction of motion. So, when the pressure also adds to the viscous action direction the fluid particles cannot stick to the boundary they separate from the boundary and that is what you call the boundary layer separation. Okay. So, the key to your pressure drag is the existence of flow separation. Had there been no separation supposing you could avoid separation what will happen whatever pressure you have lost gain your recovery they balance and there would have been very little pressure drag but it does not really happen flow separates because of which it is not able to recover the pressure which you had in the front you are not able to recover and you are ending up with a low pressure zone called the wake. So, that is why we studied the cylinder to get a feel as to what happens to the fluid particles as they go around and how is it different for an ideal fluid flow compared to a real fluid flow. So, flow separation is a real fluid flow phenomenon because of viscous action you know fluid particles are not able to stick to the boundary they go up to some extent beyond which they have to leave because of the pressure gradient which is trying to push it backwards. So, here close to it fine now this is what I showed you for a spear and the explanation here is separation of flow occurs just upstream of the mid section a little before the fluid particles are subject to a pressure hill on the rear half. This is only a technical term pressure hill means the fluid particles have to come overcome pressure. Why pressure hill when you go up the hill obviously you have to put extra you know effort. Similarly pressure hill means the pressure is trying to resist motion. So, these fluid particles have to overcome that that is why we call that as a pressure hill. Where does the pressure exist in case of a sphere or even a cylinder if I talk about in the front part there is no problem beyond 90 then the pressure starts building up it was minimum it got, so it is creating an you know adverse pressure that is what you call the pressure hill. The pressure difference between the front and the rear is the main cause of the drag slow moving particles around the mid section acquire more momentum and the turbulent boundary layer is able to resist flow separation for some more distance over the sphere. So, if that is delayed it so happens that your size of the weight will shrink and there are very beautiful pictures you will find even in internet in books they show the size of the weight for a lamina boundary layer lamina condition when the Reynolds number is less than 3 into 10 to 5 and this you call as the critical Reynolds number. The reason being that the Reynolds number close to which the boundary layer changes from lamina to a turbulent one that is why you call that critical Reynolds number. Now these things just you know have a very close what all we spoke so far can be put it in a graphical form here theta degrees 0 to 180 okay, starting from 0 here in the picture it is here to 180 means other end from here to here. Now had it been an inviscid flow similar to your cylinder there are also theories inviscid flow theory. Uh, velocity distribution, CD distribution, pressure, etc. for a sphere that is what I say theoretical inviscid. Now, had it been a inviscid flow you would have started coefficient pressure as one at the beginning goes down and you would have come back at the other stagnation point. This would have been the curve symmetric and hence if you add up all the components of the pressure force acting 
they will add to 0, you will not get any drag force, that is inviscid flow theory. But if you are talking about real fluid flow theory, let us take, let us first consider the laminar boundary layer. So, starts boundary layer starts here, grows on the sphere and at around about let us say 70, between 70, 80 degrees, it is not able to continue further and follow the theoretical one. It starts immediately deviating from the theoretical one. So, what is important here in the front part of the sphere, the viscous flow theory and your real thing, they are not very different. However, after about 70, 75 degrees here, what you see, this is no more able to follow the boundary, it separates and this is what a wake formation takes place and it is a low pressure, that is why Cp is negative quantity and because of the asymmetry between this part and the back, when you add up, you will have a finite value of form drag or pressure drag. Supposing the boundary layer becomes turbulent. So, now forget about the laminar one, concentrate on the turbulent boundary layer. What do you see now? The turbulent boundary layer is able to follow the inviscid curve to a much bigger theta value, close to 140 degrees. Whereas here it was only about 75 to 80 degrees. So, because of this exchange of momentum, which also results in exchange of energy between layers, the flow separation gets delayed and it happens at an angle of 120 degrees. So, because it is able to follow the inviscid curve to a bigger extent and then separates, what is then, what will happen to your form drag? Form drag will be much less. Take a hypothetical case, had the real case followed the right up to the end, then you would have got 0 form drag, but it cannot happen. It separates at about 120 to 140 degrees, depending on the test condition. So, this picture tells you that the front part is never a problem. Only when you are talking about the surface beyond that 80 degrees onwards, the you know pressure differentials come into picture and result in flow separation. And depending on where the flow separates, you could end up with a very large value of Cd or a small value of Cd. That is the explanation. And that was what is shown in the earlier diagram, okay. This is for a smooth sphere. Now, if you look at a cylinder, same thing, once you understand one shape of a body, the concepts are similar. So, this we have done earlier, the velocity 0 at the stagnation point, maximum value is minus 2u at theta is 90 degrees, this is all based on your inviscid flow theory. Pressure is the maximum at the upstream stagnation point, minimum at 90 degrees and recovers to attain a maximum value at the downstream point. The net force due to differential pressure on circular cylinder is 0. This is true only if the flow is an inviscid flow, but if the real fluid flow, things again are different. Now, similar to what I spoke about the spherical object, look at here. This curve comes and goes back and Cp was minus 3, this we have derived earlier at theta equal to 90 degrees, comes back to 1, starts with 1, goes to minus 3, comes back again to 1. If it is a small Reynolds number, 1.1 into 10 to 4, what do I see? Again, around 70 degrees, the flow starts deviating dramatically, there is a flow separation. So, there is a big wake and hence you will have a large 
transpose. But if the Reynolds number is increased 6.7 into 10 to 5, when I say 6.7 into 10 to 5 means you have lost the critical Reynolds number which is 2 or 3 into 10 to 5. Because you have crossed the critical Reynolds number automatically the boundary layer becomes turbulent and the point of separation now as you see here gets delayed. See when the up to 120 degrees. No, it's, although it is not able to follow this precisely but somewhere around this onwards it becomes flat not able to recover. So because of this change from laminar boundary layer to turbulent boundary layer the coefficient of drag comes down dramatically. I will show the sketch okay. and here you see the pressure difference same story pressure difference on the front and the rear surface of the cylinder gives rise to a significant drag force the pressure drag. Experimental data okay, follow the potential flow results better than the laminar boundary layer. As I said here laminar means things separate much early. If it is a turbulent one it is able to follow the, the uh, inviscid theory much better and the total drag experienced by the cylinder drops suddenly at a critical Reynolds number of 3 into 10 to the power of 5. So, a similar sketch, this I will in fact rectify because I have not given the source, but I can write the source also right here so that we finish this bit. So, here the, it is a good, very good fluid mechanics book, like a Bible, in fact. Uh, source is Listing. Nineteen sixty eight. It is a McGraw Hill publication. It is a good book, but may not be suitable for the undergraduate courses. Okay, but it is a fluid mechanics, you will have lots of things, very good explanation. And you know, if you really want to do here research in fluid mechanics, you need to study this book. You can't uh, manage otherwise. Okay. So here we stop today. Next time we will take some tutorial problems, and quite likely we may be able to finish the drag component. Then we'll talk about lift subsequently and we will see how to do that, okay.